This is The Mastermind by Napoleon Hill. Time is a diligent master that heals the wounds of temporary defeat, equalizes inequalities and corrects the world's errors. Nothing is impossible with time. You can do it if you believe you can. This is a course on the foundations of success. Success is largely a matter of adapting to the ever-changing environments of life with a spirit of harmony and balance. Harmony relies on understanding the forces that make up one's environment. Thus, this course is actually a plan that can be followed directly to success, as it helps the student interpret, understand, and make the most of these environmental forces in life. Before starting to listen to the lessons of the law of success, you must know a bit about the history of the course. You must know exactly what the course promises to those who follow it until they have assimilated the laws and principles on which it is based. You must know your limits as well as your possibilities, which will aid you in your struggle to find a place in the world. From an entertainment perspective, the Law of Success course would rank second for most monthly journals of the snap and story variety that can be found on newsstands today. The course was created for the serious individual who dedicates at least a portion of their time to succeeding in life. The author of the Law of Success course did not seek to compete with those who write solely for entertainment. The author's goal in preparing this course was twofold. First, to help the serious student discover their weaknesses. Second, to help create a definitive plan to overcome these weaknesses. The most successful men and women on earth had to correct certain weaknesses in their personality before they started to achieve success. The most notable weaknesses that stand between people and success are intolerance, greed, shame, suspicion, revenge, selfishness, conceit, the tendency to reap where one has not sown, and the inclination to spend more than one earns. All these common enemies of humanity, and many others not mentioned here, are covered by the law of success course in such a way that any person of reasonable intelligence can master them with little effort and without inconvenience. You must know from the outset that the law of success course has long passed the experimental stage and already has a track record of successes that deserves reflection and serious analysis. You must also know that the Law of Success course has been reviewed and endorsed by some of the most practical minds of this generation. The Law of Success course was first used as a lecture and was delivered by its author in practically every major city and many small towns across the United States for over seven years. You may have been one of the hundreds of thousands of people who heard this lecture. During these lectures, the author relied on assistance in the audience to interpret the reaction of those who were listening, thus learning exactly the effect he had on people. As a result of this study and analysis, many changes were made. The first great victory of the law of success philosophy was won when the author used it as the basis for a course with which he trained 3,000 men and women as a sales force. Most of these people had no prior experience in the sales field. Through this training, they were able to earn over a million dollars for themselves and paid the author $30,000 for his services, covering a period of about six months. Individuals and small groups of salespeople who found success with the help of this course. There are too many to be mentioned in this introduction, but the number is large and the benefits they derived from the course were decisive. The philosophy of the law of success reached the ears of the late Don Everett's, former editor of the Canton, Ohio Linux, who partnered with the author of the course and was preparing to resign from his position as editor of the Canton Daily News to take over the author's business affairs when he was assassinated on July 16, 1926. Before his death, Mr. Millett had made arrangements with Judge Albert H. Gary, then chairman of the board of the United States Steel Corporation, to present the Law of Success course to all employees of the Steel Corporation at a total cost of $150,000. This plan was interrupted due to Judge Gary's death, but it demonstrates that the author of the Law of Success created an enduring educational plan. The Judge Gary was eminently prepared to assess the value of such a course, and the fact that he analyzed the philosophy of the Law of Success and prepared to invest the enormous sum of $150,000 is proof of the soundness of everything said on behalf of the course. In this general introduction to the course, you will notice some technical terms that may not be very clear, 
Don't let that bother you. Don't try to understand these terms on the first listen. You will understand them when you know the rest of the course. This entire introduction is designed solely as a preamble to the 15 other lessons of the course, and you will have to listen to it as such. The examination of this introduction should be listened to many times, because with each chapter you will gain a thought, an idea that you did not have in the previous chapter. In this introduction, you will find a description of a recently discovered psychological law that is the cornerstone of all exceptional personal achievements. The author called this law the mente maestra, meaning an intelligence that develops through the harmonious cooperation of two or more people who ally themselves to accomplish any task. If you are involved in the field of sales, you can experiment with this law of mente maestra in your daily work. It has been discovered that a group of six or seven sellers can use the law so effectively that their sales can increase to incredible proportions. Life insurance is assumed to be the most challenging thing to sell in the world. This should not be true with an established need like life insurance, but it is the case. Despite this fact, a small group of men working for the Prudential Life Insurance Company, whose sales are primarily small policies, formed a small friendly group to experiment with the law of mente maestra. The result is that each man in the group wrote more insurance in the first three months of the experiment than he had written in an entire previous year. What can be achieved with the help of this principle by any small group of intelligent life insurance agents who have learned to apply the law of mente maestra will astonish the imagination of the most optimistic and imaginative person. The same can be said for other groups of sellers dedicated to selling goods and other forms of services more tangible than life insurance. Keep this in mind as you listen to this introduction to the Law of Success course, and it is not unreasonable to hope that this introduction alone will provide a sufficient understanding of the law to change the entire course of your life. It is the personalities behind a business that determine the measure of success that the business will have. Modify these personalities to make them more pleasing and attractive to the customers of the business, and it will prosper in any of the major cities in the United States. Goods of similar nature and price can be bought in dozens of stores, but there is always an outstanding store that does more business than others, and the reason is that behind that store there is a man or several who have taken care of the personalities of those who come into contact with the public. People buy personalities as well as goods, and it is a matter of whether they are more influenced by the personalities with whom they come into contact than by the goods. Life insurance has been reduced to such a scientific basis that the cost of insurance does not vary much, regardless of the company from which it is purchased. And yet, among the hundreds of life insurance companies doing business, fewer than a dozen realize the majority of the business in the United States. What is this due to? Personality. 99 out of 100 people who buy life insurance policies do not know what is in their policies, and what seems most astonishing is that it does not seem to matter to them. What they are actually buying is the pleasant personality of a man or woman who understands the value of cultivating such a personality. Your success in life, or at least the most important part of it, is to achieve success. Success in the sense of that term as envisioned in this course on the 15 laws of success is the realization of your main goal defined without violating the rights of others, whatever your main aspiration in life. You will achieve this with much less difficulty after learning to cultivate a pleasant personality and mastering the delicate art of collaborating with others in a given enterprise without friction or jealousy. One of the greatest problems in life, if not the greatest, is learning the art of harmonious negotiation with others. This course was created with the aim of teaching people to navigate their way through life with harmony and confidence, free from the destructive effects of disagreement and friction that lead millions of people to misery, need and failure every year. With this statement of the course's objective, you should be able to approach the lessons with the sense that a complete transformation of your personality is about to occur. Extraordinary success in life cannot be enjoyed without power, and one cannot ever enjoy power without a sufficient personality to influence others to cooperate with you in a spirit of harmony. This course shows step by step how to develop that personality lesson by lesson. 
The following is a statement of what you can expect to receive from the 15 laws of success. A definite chief aim will teach you how to save the unnecessary effort that most people invest in trying to find their life's work. This lesson will show you how to end forever the lack of goals and set your heart and hand on a definite and well-designed purpose as your life's work. Self-confidence will help you master the six basic fears that every person faces. The fear of poverty, the fear of ill health, the fear of old age, the fear of criticism, the fear of loss of love, and the fear of death. It will teach you the difference between selfishness and true self-confidence based on defined and usable knowledge. The habit of saving will teach you how to systematically distribute your income so that a determined percentage accumulates steadily, forming one of the greatest sources of known personal power. No one can succeed in life without saving money. There is no exception to this rule and no one can escape it. Initiative and leadership will show you how to become a leader rather than a follower in the field of your choice. They will develop in you the instinct of leadership that will gradually propel you to the top in all the enterprises you engage in. Imagination will stimulate your mind to generate new ideas and develop new plans that will help you achieve the goal of your definite chief aim. This lesson will teach you to build new things with old elements, so to speak. It will show you how to create new ideas from old and well-known concepts and how to give new uses to old ideas. This lesson alone is equivalent to a very practical sales course and will surely be a real gold mine of knowledge for the person who takes it seriously. Enthusiasm will enable you to arouse interest in yourself and your ideas with everyone you come into contact with. Enthusiasm is the foundation of a pleasant personality, and you must have such a personality to be able to influence others to cooperate. Self-control is the steering wheel with which you control your enthusiasm and direct it where you want it to take you. This lesson will teach you in the most practical way to become the master of your destiny, the captain of your soul. The habit of doing more than paid for is one of the most important lessons in the Law of Success course. It will teach you how to exploit the law of increasing returns, which will eventually ensure you a return much higher than the service you render. No one can become a true leader in any field of life without practicing the habit of doing more and better work than what they are paid for. Pleasing personality is the fulcrum on which the lever of your efforts must rest, and when intelligently placed, it will enable you to remove mountains of obstacles. This lesson alone has made many master salesmen, developed leaders overnight. It will teach you how to transform your personality so that it can adapt to any environment or any other personality so that you can easily dominate it. Accurate thinking is one of the cornerstones of any lasting success. This lesson will teach you how to separate facts from mere information. It will teach you to organize known facts into two categories, the important and the unimportant. It will teach you how to determine what is an important fact and instruct you to build definite working plans in the pursuit of any vocation from facts. Concentration will teach you to focus your attention on one subject at a time until you have developed practical plans to master that subject. It will instruct you to ally with others in such a way that you can use all their knowledge to support you in your own plans and goals. It will give you a practical knowledge of the forces around you and show you how to exploit and use these forces to promote your own interests. Cooperation will teach you the value of teamwork in everything you do. In this lesson, you will learn how to apply the law of the mente maestra described in the introduction and in lesson two of this course. This lesson will show you how to coordinate your own efforts with those of others in a way that eliminates friction, jealousy, struggles, envy, and greed. You will learn how to leverage everything that other people have learned about the work you have committed to. Profiting by failure will teach you how to make strides with all your past and future mistakes and failures. You will learn the difference between failure and temporary defeat, a difference that is very large and important. You will learn how to profit from your own failures and the failures of others. Tolerance will teach you how to avoid the disastrous effects of racial and religious prejudices, which mean defeat for millions of people who get entangled in futile discussions on these subjects, thus poisoning their own minds and shutting the door to reason and inquiry. This lesson is the twin sister of precise thinking because no one can become a precise thinker 
without practicing tolerance. Intolerance closes the book of knowledge and writes on the cover, The end, I have learned everything. Intolerance turns those who should be friends into enemies, destroys opportunities, and fills the mind with doubts, mistrust, and prejudices. The practice of the Golden Rule will teach you how to use this great universal law of human behavior in a way that easily obtains the harmonious cooperation of any individual or group of individuals. Ignorance of the law on which the philosophy of the Golden Rule is based is one of the main causes of the failure of millions of people who remain in misery, poverty and need throughout their lives. This lesson has nothing to do with religion in any form or sectarianism, just like any of the other lessons in this course on the law of success. When you have mastered these 15 laws and integrated them, as you can do in 15 to 30 weeks, you will be ready to develop enough personal power and ensure the achievement of your definite chief aim. The purpose of these 15 laws is to develop or help you organize all the knowledge you have and will acquire in the future so that you can convert this knowledge into power. You should listen to the Law of Success course with a notebook by your side because you will find that ideas will start to flow into your mind as you listen. As for ways to use these laws to promote your own interests, you should also start teaching these laws to those who interest you the most because it is well known that the more one tries to teach a subject, the more one learns about the subject. A man with a family of young boys and girls can indelibly engrave these 15 laws of success in their minds. Teaching that will change the course of their lives. The man with a family should interest his wife in studying this course with him for reasons that will become clear before finishing listening to this introduction. Power is one of the three fundamental objects of human effort. Power is divided into two categories, that which is developed by the coordination of natural physical laws and that which is developed by organizing and classifying knowledge. The power that comes from organized knowledge is the most important because it gives man a tool with which he can transform, direct and, to some extent, leverage the other form of power. The goal of this course is to trace the path that the student can safely follow in collecting the facts he may wish to gather into his framework of knowledge. There are two main methods of collecting knowledge namely through the study, classification, and assimilation of facts that have been organized by others, and through the process of collecting, organizing, and classifying facts, generally called personal experience. This lesson mainly deals with the forms and means of studying facts and data collected and classified by other people. The state of advancement known as civilization is nothing more than the measure of knowledge accumulated by the race. This knowledge is of two types, mental and physical, among the useful knowledge organized by man, he has been able to discover and catalogue the 80 or so physical elements of which all material forms of the universe are composed, thanks to study, analysis, and precise measurements. Man has discovered the grandeur of the material part of the universe, represented by planets, suns, and stars, some of which are known to be more than 10 million times larger than the small Earth on which we live, as well as molecules, atoms, and electrons. To understand both the detail and the perspective of the process by which knowledge is gathered, organized and classified, it seems essential that the student begin with the smallest and simplest particles of physical matter, as these are the A, B, C with which nature has built the entire framework of the physical part of the universe. The molecule is formed of atoms, which are invisible particles of matter continually rotating at the speed of light exactly according to the same principle as the Earth rotates around the Sun. These small particles of matter, known as atoms, which continually circulate in the molecule, are said to be formed of electrons, the smallest particles of physical matter. As mentioned earlier, the electron is nothing more than two forms of force. The electron is uniform in size and nature of a single class. Thus, in a grain of sand or a drop of water, the entire principle on which the entire universe operates is duplicated. What a marvel! What a wonderful idea can be obtained from the magnitude of all this the next time you eat, remembering that every food you ingest, the plate on which you eat, the dishes, and even the table are ultimately nothing more than a set of electrons. The world of physical matter, whether you observe the largest star floating in the sky or the smallest grain of sand on the earth, 
the observed object is more than an organized set of molecules, atoms and electrons revolving around each other at an inconceivable speed. Every particle of physical matter is in a continuous state of extremely agitated movement. Nothing is ever still, although almost all physical matter may seem still to the motionless physical eye. There is no solid physical matter. The hardest piece of steel is nothing more than a more organized set of molecules, atoms and electrons in rotation. Furthermore, the electrons in a piece of steel are of the same nature and move at the same speed as the electrons in gold, silver, brass or tin. The 80 forms of physical matter seem to be different from each other and are so because they are formed of different combinations of atoms, although the electrons of these atoms are always the same, except that some electrons are positive and others negative, meaning that some carry a positive charge of electrification while others carry a negative charge. Through the science of chemistry, matter can be divided into atoms that are themselves immutable. The 80 elements are created through and due to the combination and change of positions of atoms to illustrate the mode of operation of chemistry through which this change of atomic position occurs. In terms of modern science, it can be said that it adds four electrons, two positive and two negative, to the hydrogen atom, and this forms the element lithium. It removes from the lithium atom, composed of three positive and three negative electrons, one positive electron and one negative electron, thus forming a helium atom, composed of two positive electrons and two negative electrons. In this way, it can be seen that the 80 physical elements of the universe differ only by the number of electrons composing their atoms and by the number and arrangement of these atoms in the molecules of each element. For example, a mercury atom contains 80 positive charges, electrons, in its nucleus and 80 external negative charges, electrons. If the chemist expelled two of its positive electrons, it would instantly transform into the metal known as platinum. If the chemist took one more step and removed a planetary negative electron, the mercury atom would have lost two positive electrons and one negative electron, i.e. a total positive charge. Thus, it would retain 79 positive charges in the nucleus and 79 peripheral negative electrons, thus becoming gold. The formula through which this electron change can occur has been the subject of diligent research by alchemists of all ages and modern chemists today. It is a known fact to all chemists that literally tens of thousands of synthetic substances can be composed of only four types of atoms, namely hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and carbon. The difference in the number of electrons of atoms gives them chemical qualitative differences. Although all atoms of any element are chemically identical, the difference in the number and spatial arrangement of these atoms in groups of molecules constitutes physical and chemical differences in substances, i.e. very different compounds can be produced by exactly the same types of atoms but in different proportions. If one takes a molecule of some substances, a single atom can go from being a necessary compound for life and growth to becoming a deadly poison. Phosphorus is an element and therefore contains only one type of atom, but some phosphors are yellow and others are red. By varying the spatial distribution of atoms in the molecules that make up phosphorus, one can literally say that the atom is the universal particle with which nature builds all material forms, from a grain of sand to the largest star floating in space. The atom is the building block of nature with which it erects an oak or a pine, a sandstone or granite rock, a mouse or an elephant. Some of the most astute thinkers have reasoned that the earth on which we live and every material particle of the earth began with two atoms that united with each other and through hundreds of millions of years of traveling through space they continued to come into contact and accumulate other atoms until gradually the earth formed. This would explain the different and distinct strata of earthly substances such as coal deposits, iron, gold and silver, copper, etc. They argue that by rotating in space, the Earth came into contact with groups of different types of nebulae or atoms that it quickly appropriated through the law of magnetic attraction. In the composition of the Earth's surface, there are many indications supporting this theory, although there is no positive proof of its soundness. 
These facts about the smallest analyzable particles of matter have been briefly mentioned as a starting point from which we will undertake the development and application of the law of power. It has been observed that all matter is in a constant state of vibration or movement. The molecule is made up of rapidly moving particles called atoms, which in turn are composed of swiftly moving particles called electrons. In every particle of matter, there exists a fluid or invisible force that causes the atoms to revolve around each other at an inconceivable speed. This fluid is a form of energy that has never been analyzed so far and has puzzled the entire scientific community. Many scientists believe it to be the same energy we call electricity, while others prefer to call it vibration. Some researchers believe that the speed at which this force moves, whatever name it is given, largely determines the nature of the visible external appearance of physical objects in the universe. A cup of vibrations of this fluid energy produces what we call sound. The human ear can only detect sound produced through vibrations between 32,000 and 38,000 per second. As the rate of vibrations per second increases beyond what we call sound, they begin to manifest as heat. Heat begins at around one and a half million vibrations per second, and higher up on the scale, vibrations begin to be recorded as light. Three million vibrations per second create violet light. Beyond this number, vibration emits invisible ultraviolet rays to the naked eye and other invisible radiations. And even higher on the scale, no one seems to know to what extent vibrations create the power with which man thinks. The author believes that the fluid portion of any vibration from which all known forms of energy emerge is of a universal nature. The fluid portion of sound is the same as the fluid portion of light, the difference in effect between sound and light being only a difference in the rate of vibration. Similarly, the fluid portion of thought is exactly the same as that of sound, heat and light, except for the number of vibrations per second. Just as there is only one form of physical matter of which it is composed on Earth and on all other planets, suns and stars, the electron there is also a form of fluid energy that keeps all matter in a constant state of rapid movement, namely air and ether. The vastness of space between the suns, moons, stars and other planets in the universe is filled with a form of energy known as ether. This author believes that the fluid energy that keeps all particles of matter in motion is the same as the universal fluid known as ether, which fills all space in the universe. At some distance from the Earth's surface, which some estimate to be about 50 kilometers, there is what is called air, a gaseous substance composed of oxygen and nitrogen. Air is the conductor of sound vibrations, but is not a conductor of light and higher vibrations that are carried by ether. Ether is a conductor of all vibrations, from sound to thought. Air is a localized substance that primarily serves to sustain all animal and plant life with oxygen and nitrogen, without which neither could exist. Nitrogen is one of the main necessities of plant life, and oxygen is one of the pillars of animal life. Near the tops of very high mountains, the air becomes very light as it contains very little nitrogen, which is why plant life cannot exist there. On the other hand, the light air found at great altitudes is composed mainly of oxygen, which is the main reason why tuberculosis patients are sent to high altitudes. Even this brief exposition on molecules, atoms, electrons, air, ether and others may seem heavy to listen to for the student, but as you will soon find out, this introduction plays an essential role as the foundation of this lesson. Do not be discouraged if the description of this foundation does not seem to have the exciting effects of a modern fiction tale. You are seriously engaged in discovering your available powers and how to organize and apply these powers to complete this journey successfully. This success must combine determination, persistence and a well-defined desire to gather and organize knowledge. The late Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the long-distance telephone and one of the recognized authorities on the subject of vibrations, is presented here in support of this author's theories on the subject of vibrations. Let's assume that you have the power to make an iron rod vibrate at any desired frequency in a dark room. Initially, when it vibrates slowly, its movement will be indicated by a single sense, touch. As the vibrations increase, a low sound will emanate, 
engaging two senses at around 32,000 vibrations per second. The sound will be loud and shrill at 40,000 vibrations. It will be silent, and the movements of the rod will not be perceptible to touch. Its movements will not be perceived by any ordinary human sense. From this point up to about one and a half million vibrations per second, we have no sense that can appreciate any effects of intermediate vibrations. Once this state is reached, movement is first indicated by the sense of temperature. Then, when the rod becomes incandescent, by the sense of sight. At three million, it emits ultraviolet light. Beyond this figure, it emits ultraviolet rays and other invisible radiations, some of which can be perceived by instruments and used by us. Ah. It occurred to me that there must be much to learn about the effect of these vibrations in the vast gap where ordinary human senses are unable to hear, see, or feel the movement. The power to send wireless messages through the vibrations of ether lies in this gap, but it is so vast that it seems there must be much more to crafting machines that practically provide new senses, just as wireless instruments do. One could say that when thinking about this significant gap, there are many forms of vibrations that can yield results as marvelous, if not more so, than wireless waves. It seems to me that within this gap are the vibrations we have assumed to emit from our brains and nerve cells when we think. But then again, they might be higher up on the scale, beyond the vibrations that produce ultraviolet rays. We would need a cable to carry these vibrations. They will not pass through ether without a cable, just as wireless waves are perceived by the receiver or a series of signals, or you will discover that another man's thoughts have entered your brain. We can afford some speculation based on what we know about wireless waves, which, as I mentioned, are all we can recognize from a vast series of vibrations that theoretically must exist. If thought waves are similar to wireless waves, they must emanate from the brain and continuously circulate through the world and the universe. The body, skull, and other solid obstacles would pose no obstruction to their passage because they pass through the ether that surrounds the molecules of any substance, no matter how solid and dense. One may wonder if there would not be constant interferences and confusions if other people's thoughts circulated in our brain and entered into thought without originating from it. How do they know that other men's thoughts do not interfere with theirs? I have observed quite a number of mental disturbances that I have never been able to explain, such as the inspiration or discouragement felt by a speaker addressing an experienced audience. I have often experienced this in my life and have never been able to exactly define the physical causes of it. Many recent scientific discoveries, in my opinion, indicate a possibly near day when men will be able to read each other's thoughts, where thoughts will be transmitted directly from brain to brain without the intervention of speech, writing or any of the currently known means of communication. It is not absurd to expect a time when we will see without eyes, hear without ears, and speak without tongues. In short, the hypothesis that the mind can communicate directly with the mind is based on the theory that thought or life force is a form of electrical disturbance that can be taken by induction and transmitted remotely, either through a cable or simply through the ether that permeates everything, as in the case of wireless telegraphic waves. There are many analogies that suggest that thought is of the nature of an electrical disturbance. A nerve, which is of the same substance as the brain, is an excellent conductor of electric current. When we pass an electric current through the nerves of a dead man for the first time, we are surprised to see him straighten up and move. The electrified nerves produced a muscle contraction very similar to that of life. Nerves seem to act on muscles very similarly to how electric current acts on an electromagnet. The current magnetizes an iron bar placed at right angles to it, and nerves produce through the intangible current of the life force flowing through them, the contraction of muscle fibers arranged at right angles to them. It would be impossible to cite many reasons why thought and life force can be considered of the same nature as electricity. Electric current is considered a wave motion of ether, the hypothetical substance that fills all space and pervades all substances. We believe that ether must exist because without it, electric current could not pass in a vacuum nor could sunlight in space. It is reasonable to believe that a single wave motion of a similar character can produce the phenomena of thought and life force. We can assume that brain cells act like a battery and that the current produced 
circulates along the nerves but stops there. It does not exit the body in the form of waves that travel through the world unnoticed by our senses, like wireless waves go unnoticed, before being captured by the receiver or discovered by others. Each mind is both a transmitter and a receiving station. This author has demonstrated on several occasions, to enumerate at least to his own satisfaction, that every human brain is both a transmitting and receiving station for thought frequency vibrations. If this theory were to prove it to be a fact, and reasonable control methods established, imagine the role it would play in the collection, classification, and organization of knowledge. The possibility, let alone the probability, of such a reality is mind-boggling. Thomas Paine was one of the great figures of the American Revolutionary period. To him, perhaps more than to anyone else, we owe as much the beginning as the successful end of the revolution, for he helped draft the Declaration of Independence and persuaded the signers to translate that document into terms of reality. Speaking of the source of his vast reservoir of knowledge, Paine described it thus, Any person making observations on the progress of the human mind by observing his own, can only perceive that there are two distinct classes of what is called thought, that which we produce in ourselves by reflection and the act of thinking, and that which is forced upon the mind of its own accord. It is customary to treat these voluntary visitors with oneself, making sure to examine to the extent of one's ability if they are worth entertaining. And it is from them that I have acquired almost all the knowledge I possess. Regarding learning, what any person gets from school education serves only as a small capital to put them on the road to beginning to learn by themselves. Then, every learning person is eventually their own teacher for the reason that principles cannot be imprinted on memory. Their mental abode is understanding, and they are never as enduring as when they begin with conception. In the preceding words, Paine, the great American patriot and philosopher, described an experience that is at one time or another that of every person unfortunate enough not to have received positive proof that thoughts and even complete ideas appear in the mind from external sources. What other means of conveyance exists for these visitors than ether? Ether fills the boundless space of the universe and is the means of transport for all known forms of vibrations such as sound, light and heat. Why would it not also be the means of transport for thought vibration? Each mind or brain is directly connected to all other brains through ether. Every thought emitted by any brain can be instantly picked up and interpreted by all other brains in relation to the emitting brain. This author is as certain of this fact as of the chemical formula H2O producing water. Imagine, if you can, the role this principle plays in all areas of life. The likelihood that ether is a carrier of thoughts from brain to brain is not the most astonishing of its performances. This author believes that every thought vibration released by any brain is gathered by ether and kept in motion on winding wavelengths corresponding to the intensity of the energy used in its release. These vibrations belong to a perpetual motion, being one of the two sources from which most thoughts emanating in someone's mind come the other source being the direct and immediate contact through ether, with the brain releasing the thought vibration. Thus one can see that if this theory is a fact, the boundless space of the entire universe is now and will continue to be literally a mental library in which all thoughts released by humanity can be found. The author lays here the foundation for one of the most important hypotheses listed in this selection, self-confidence, a fact the student must take into account it is a lesson on organized knowledge. Most useful knowledge that humanity has inherited has been preserved and accurately recorded in the Bible of nature. By perusing the pages of this intelligible Bible, man has read the story of the terrible struggle through which present civilization has grown. This Bible began before man reached the stage of thought, indeed before man reached the stage of the development of the unicellular animal amoeba. This Bible is beyond and above man's power to alter. Moreover, it does not relate its story in the ancient dead languages or hieroglyphs of semi-savage races, but in a universal language that all those with eyes can read. The Bible of nature, from which we have extracted all worthwhile knowledge, is one that no man can alter or manipulate in any way. The most wonderful discovery made so far by man 
is that of the recently discovered radio principle that operates with the aid of ether, an important part of the Bible of nature. Imagine ether collecting the ordinary vibration of sound and transforming that low-frequency vibration into high-frequency, carrying it to a properly tuned receiving station and transforming it back there again into its original low-frequency form. All this process takes place in an instant. It should surprise no one that such a force could gather the vibration of thought and keep that vibration in motion forever. The established and well-known fact of the instantaneous transmission of sound through ether via modern radio devices eliminates the theory of transmitting thought vibrations from brain to brain, from possible to probable. We now come to the next step in describing the forms and means by which one can gather, classify and organize useful knowledge through the harmonious alliance of two or more minds giving rise to a mastermind. The term mastermind is abstract and has no counterpart in the realm of known facts, except for a number of individuals who have studied carefully the effect of one mind upon others. This author searched in vain through all available manuals and essays on the subject of the human mind, but nowhere found the slightest reference to the principle described here as the master mind. The term first caught the author's attention during an interview with Andrew Carnegie, as described in Lesson 2 of The Chemistry of the Mind. This author believes that the mind is formed by the same universal fluid energy that constructs the ether filling the universe. It is a fact as known to the ego as to the man of scientific research that certain thoughts clash at the moment of their contact, while others show a natural affinity between them. Between the two extremes of natural antagonism and natural affinity resulting from the contact or meeting of minds, there is a wide range of possibilities for the various reactions of one mind upon another. Some minds are so naturally suited to each other that love at first sight is the inevitable result of contact. In other cases, minds are so antagonistic that mutual repulsion manifests violently from the first encounter. Results occur without a word being spoken and without the slightest signs of the usual causes of love and hate that act as stimuli. It is very probable that the mind is formed of a fluid or energetic substance, call it what you will, similar if not indeed the same substance as ether. When two minds approach closely enough to form contact, the mingling of units of this mental matter, let's call them the electrons of ether, establishes a chemical reaction and initiates vibrations that affect two individuals in a pleasant or unpleasant manner. The effect of the meeting of two minds is evident even to the most casual observer. Every effect must have a cause. What could be more reasonable than to suspect that the cause of the change in mental attitude between two minds that have just come into contact is nothing other than the disturbance of the electrons or units of each mind in the process of reorganization in the new field created by contact. To establish this lesson on a solid foundation, we have come a long way towards success by admitting that the meeting or close contact between two minds establishes in each of them a certain effect or mental state that is markedly different from what existed immediately before contact. Although desirable, it is not essential to know what causes this mind-to-mind -mind reaction. The fact that the reaction takes place in all cases is a known fact that gives. Use a starting point from which we can explain what the term master mind means. A mastermind can be created by the union or blending in one mind of perfect harmony between two or more minds. From this harmonious blend, the chemistry of the mind creates a third mind that can be appropriated and used by one or all individual minds. This mastermind will remain available as long as there is a friendly and harmonious alliance between the individual minds. It will disintegrate and all evidence of its previous existence will disappear as soon as the friendly alliance is broken. This principle of the chemistry of the mind is the basis and cause of practically all so-called soulmate cases and the eternal triangle, many of which unfortunately end up in divorce courts and encounter the popular ridicule of ignorant and uncultured people who manufacture vulgarity and scandal from one of the greatest laws of nature. Every civilized person knows that the first two or three years of partnership after marriage are often marked by many disagreements of a more or less petty nature. These are the years of adjustment. If the marriage survives them, 
it is more than likely to become a permanent alliance. No married person with experience will deny these facts. Again, we find the effect without understanding the cause. Although there are other contributing causes, the lack of harmony during these early years of marriage is generally due to the slow blending of the chemistry of the minds into perfect harmony. In other words, the electrons or units of the energy called mind are generally neither extremely friendly nor antagonistic at first contact, but through constant association they gradually adapt to harmony. Except in rare cases where association has the opposite effect, ultimately leading to open hostility between these units. It is a well-known fact that after two people, a man and a woman, have lived together for 10 or 15 years, they become practically indispensable to each other, even if there is not the slightest evidence of the feeling called love. Furthermore, this association and sexual relationship not only develop a natural affinity between the two minds, but they truly make people adopt a similar facial expression and resemble each other in many marked ways. ChatGPT any competent analyst of human nature can easily walk into a crowd of strangers and pick out the wife after being introduced to her husband. The expression in the eyes, the contour of the faces, and the tone of the voices of people who have been associated for a long time in marriage become similar to a very marked extent. The effect of the chemistry of the human mind is so remarkable that any experienced public speaker can quickly interpret how his statements are received by his audience. The speaker who has learned to feel and record the effects of antagonism can easily detect antagonism in the mind of a single person within an audience of a thousand people. Moreover, the public speaker can make interpretations without observing or being influenced in any way by the expression on the faces of the audience. Thanks to this fact, an audience can lead a speaker to achieve great heights in the art of oratory or boo him to failure without emitting a sound or showing a single expression of satisfaction or dissatisfaction through facial features. All salesmasters know when the psychological moment of conclusion has arrived, not by what the potential buyer says, but by the effect of the chemistry of his mind as interpreted or felt. The seller, words often tend to belie the intentions of those who utter them, but a correct interpretation of the chemistry of the mind leaves no room for this possibility. Every skillful salesman knows that most buyers are accustomed to adopting a negative attitude, almost to the climax of the sale. Every skillful lawyer has developed a sixth sense that allows him to sense, through the cleverly chosen words of the intelligent witness who lies, and to correctly interpret what is in the mind of the witness through the chemistry of the mind. Many lawyers have developed stability without knowing their true origin, Possessing the technique without the scientific understanding on which it rests, many salespeople have done the same. One who is gifted in the art of correctly understanding the chemistry of others' minds can, metaphorically speaking, enter through the main door of a particular mind's mansion and quickly explore the entire building, noting every detail, then leaving with a complete picture of the inside of the building without the owner. Even knowing he received a visit, it will be noted in the choice of exact thought that this principle can have a very practical application with reference to the principle of the chemistry of the mind. The principle is simply mentioned as an approach to the most important principles of this lesson. Enough has already been said to introduce the principle of the chemistry of the mind and to demonstrate, with the help of everyday experiences and casual observations of the student, that when two minds come close, a notable mental change occurs in both, sometimes recorded in the nature of antagonism and other times in the nature of friendship. Each mind has what could be called an electric field, the nature of which varies depending on the mood of the individual mind supporting it and the nature of the chemistry of the mind that creates the field. The author considers the normal or natural condition of the chemistry of any individual mind to be the result of its physical inheritance plus the nature of the thoughts that have dominated that mind. Each mind continually changes as the general philosophy and thinking habits of the individual change in the chemistry of his mind. The author believes these principles to be true, that any individual can voluntarily change the chemistry of his mind to attract or repel all those with whom he comes in contact. 
It is a known fact that anyone can adopt a mental attitude that will attract and please others or repel and antagonize them without the aid of words, facial expressions, or other forms of body movement or behavior. Let us now return to the definition of the master mind, a mind that emerges from the fusion and coordination of two or more minds into a mind of perfect harmony, and thus understand the full meaning of the word harmony as used here. Two minds will not blend or coordinate unless the element of perfect harmony is present, where lies the secret of the success or failure of virtually all business and social associations, every sales manager, every military commander and leader in any other field of life. Understanding the need for a common esprit de corps, a spirit of common understanding and cooperation to achieve success. The massive spirit of harmony of goals is obtained through voluntary or forced discipline of a nature, such that individual minds blend into a mastermind, meaning the chemistry of individual minds is modified in such a way that these minds blend and function as one. The methods by which this blending process is accomplished are as numerous as the individuals participating in different forms of leadership. Each leader has his own method of coordinating the minds of followers. One will use force, another persuasion. One will play on the fear of sanctions, while the other will play on rewards to reduce the individual minds of a determined group of people until they can blend into a massive spirit. The student will not need to look deep into the history of statesmen, politics, business or finance to discover the technique. Employed by leaders in these fields, in the process of blending individual minds into a massive spirit. True great leaders of the world, however, have been endowed by nature with a favorable mental chemical combination as a nucleus of attraction for other minds. Napoleon was a remarkable example of a man who possessed the magnetic type of mind with a strong tendency to attract all minds with whom he came into contact. Soldiers followed Napoleon to certain death without flinching because of the imperious or attractive nature of his personality, and that personality was nothing other than the chemistry of his mind. No group of minds can merge into a master thought if one of the individuals in that group possesses one of those extremely negative and repulsive minds. Negative and positive minds do not blend in the sense described here of a master thought, Lack of knowledge of this fact has led to the defeat of many leaders who, if they had acted differently, would have been very capable. Any competent leader who understands this principle of mental chemistry can temporarily blend the minds of virtually any group of people in a way that represents a master thought, but the composition will disintegrate almost the moment the leader's presence is withdrawn from the group. The most successful life insurance sales organizations and other sales forces come together once a week or more often, but for what purpose? The purpose is to merge individual minds into a master thought that for a limited number of days will serve as a stimulant to individual minds. It may be, and usually is, that the leaders of these groups do not understand what is really happening at these meetings, often called encouragement meetings. The routine of these meetings usually consists of speeches by the leader and other members of the group and occasionally by someone outside the group while the minds of individuals come into contact and recharge each other. The human brain can be compared to an electric battery in the sense that it will discharge, making its owner feel downcast, discouraged and lacking in energy. Who has been fortunate enough never to feel this? The human brain, when in this state of exhaustion, must be recharged, and the way to do this is through contact with one or more more vital minds. Great leaders understand the needs of the recharging process and also understand how to achieve this result. This knowledge is the main feature that distinguishes a leader from a fortunate follower. The person who understands this principle well enough to keep his brain vitalized by periodically recharging it with a more vital mind contact is one who can lead effectively. Sexual contact is one of the most effective stimuli through which a mind can be recharged as long as the contact is made intelligently between a man and a woman who have a genuine affection for each other. Any kind of sexual relationship is a devitalizer of the mind. Any competent psychotherapy professional can recharge a brain in a few minutes before moving on to the brief reference made. Sexual contact as a means of revitalizing an exhausted mind 
seems appropriate to emphasize the fact that all great leaders in any field of life that have emerged have been and are highly sexed individuals. The word sex is not an indecent word. You will find it in all dictionaries. There is a growing tendency among well-informed doctors and other health professionals to accept the theory that all diseases begin when the individual's brain is in an exhausted and devitalized state. In other words, it is known that a person who has a perfectly vitalized brain is practically, if not totally, immune to all types of diseases. Any intelligent health professional from any school or type knows that nature or the mind heals disease. In all cases where a cure is performed, drugs, faith, laying on of hands, chiropractic, osteopathy, and all other forms of external stimuli are nothing more than artificial aids to nature, or, to put it correctly, simple methods of setting in motion the chemistry of the mind to readjust the cells and tissues of the body, revitalize the brain, and make the human machine operate normally. The most orthodox practitioner will admit the truth of this statement. What then can be the possibilities of future developments in the field of mental chemistry through the principle of the harmonious blending of minds? One can enjoy perfect health with the help of this same principle. One can develop enough power to solve the problem of economic pressure that constantly weighs on every individual. We can judge the future possibilities of mental chemistry by taking an inventory of its past achievements, considering that these achievements have largely been the result of accidental discoveries and fortuitous groupings of minds. We are approaching the time when university teachers will teach mental chemistry in the same way they now teach other subjects. In the meantime, study and experimentation regarding this subject open up possibilities for the individual student. The chemistry of the mind and the economic power that mental chemistry can be correctly applied to the daily affairs of the economic and business world is a demonstrable fact through the blending of two or more minds in a spirit of perfect harmony. The principle of mental chemistry can be used to develop enough power to enable individuals whose minds have been thus blended to achieve seemingly superhuman feats. Power is the force with which man achieves success in any enterprise. Unlimited power can be enjoyed by any group of men or women who possess the wisdom to merge their own personalities and their own immediate individual interests by blending their minds into a spirit of perfect harmony. Observe with profit how frequently the word harmony appears throughout this introduction. A mastermind cannot be developed where this element of perfect harmony does not exist. The individual units of the mind will not blend with the individual units of another mind until both minds have ensured and heated themselves, of course, with a spirit of perfect harmony of purpose. At the moment when two minds begin to take divergent paths of interest, the individual units of each mind separate, and the third element, known as the master mind, arising from the friendly or harmonious alliance, will disintegrate. We now come to the study of certain well-known men who have accumulated great power as well as immense fortunes through the application of mental chemistry. Let's begin our study with three men known for their great achievements in their respective fields of economics, business and professional activity. Their names are Henry Ford, Thomas Edison and Firestone. Among the three, Henry Ford is by far the most powerful in terms of economic and financial power. Mr. Ford is the most powerful man currently on earth, at least according to available knowledge. Many who have studied Mr. Ford believe he is the most powerful person ever to have existed. As far as is known, Mr. Ford is the only living or ever living man with enough power to challenge the reserve of money in the United States. Monsieur Ford gathers millions of dollars as easily as a child fills a sand bucket while playing on the beach. It is said that if Mr. Ford needed to, he could issue a money call and gather one trillion dollars, one thousand billion dollars, and make it available for his use within a week. No one doubts this among those who are familiar with Mr. Ford's achievements. Those who know him well understand that he could do it with no more effort than the average person expends to gather money to pay a month's rent for a house. While Mr. Ford's new car was being perfected in 1927, it is said that he received advance orders with cash payments for over 375,000 cars at the estimated price of $600 per car. 
This would amount to $225 billion that he received before a single car was even delivered. Such is the power of confidence in Ford's ability. Mr. Edison, as everyone knows, is a scientific philosopher and inventor, perhaps the most insightful student of the Bible of nature on earth. A student of the Bible of nature, however, not at all of man-made Bibles. Mr. Edison has such a keen insight into the Bible of Mother Nature that he has exploited and combined, for the benefit of humanity, more laws of nature than any other living or ever-living person. It is he who joined the point of a needle and a rotating piece of wax so that the vibration of the human voice could be recorded and reproduced through the modern talking machine. Perhaps it is Edison who will finally enable man to grasp and correctly interpret the vibrations of thought that are now recorded in the boundless universe of the ether, just as he allowed man to record and reproduce spoken speech. It is Edison who first used the ray and made it serve as light for man's use, with the help of the incandescent electric bulb. It is Edison who gave the world the modern moving picture. These are some of his most remarkable achievements, these modern miracles he accomplished not through deception under the false pretense of supernatural power, but in the very heart of the brilliant light of science. They transcend all the so-called miracles described in fiction books created by man. Mr. Firestone is the mind behind the great Firestone tire industry in Akron, Ohio. His industrial achievements are so well known wherever cars are used that it seems unnecessary to make special comment on it, these three men began their entrepreneurial and professional careers without capital and with little education of the type generally called education. All three men received a good education. All three are rich, all three are powerful. Let's now examine the source of their wealth and power. So far, we have only dealt with the effect. The true philosopher wants to understand the cause of a given effect. It is public knowledge that Messrs. Ford, Edison and Firestone are close friends and have been for many years. In previous years, it is said that they used to go to the woods once a year for a period of rest, meditation and recovery, but this is not widely known. It is a serious uncertainty if these three men still do it. There is a bond of harmony between the three men that has caused their minds to blend into a mastermind, which is the true source of each one's power. This massive mind, arising from the harmonization of the individual minds of Ford, Edison and Firestone has allowed them to tune into forces and sources of knowledge with which most men are unfamiliar. If the student doubts the principle or effects described here, let him remember that more than half of the theory presented is a known fact. For example, it is known that these three men have great power. It is known that they are rich. It is known that they started without capital and with little education and that they establish periodic mental contacts. It is known that they are harmonious and friendly. Their achievements are so exceptional that they cannot be compared to those of other men in their respective fields of activity. All these effects are known to practically every scholar in the civilized world, so there can be no dispute about the effects of a fact related to the cause of the achievements of Edison, Ford and Firestone. We can be sure that these achievements were in no way based on deception, the supernatural, alleged revelations, or any other form of unnatural law. These men have no power of prediction, they work with natural laws. Laws that are mostly well known to all economists and leaders in the field of science, with the possible exception of the law on which mental chemistry is based. Mental chemistry is not yet sufficiently developed to be classified by scientists in their catalogue of known laws. A mastermind can be created by any group of people coordinating their minds in a spirit of perfect harmony, the group can consist of any number from two people. The best results seem to be obtained with the combination of six or seven minds. It has been discovered that Jesus Christ understood how to use the principle of mental chemistry, and his seemingly miraculous performances stemmed from the power he developed through the blending of the minds of his twelve disciples. It was noted that when one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, broke faith, the mastermind immediately disintegrated and Jesus found himself in the supreme catastrophe of his life. When two or more people harmonize their minds and produce the effect known as the mastermind, each person in the group 
is invested with the power to contact the subconscious minds of all other members of the group and accumulate knowledge through them. This power is immediately felt, stimulating the mind to a higher vibratory frequency, manifesting otherwise as a vivid imagination and the awareness of what seems to be a sixth sense. It is through this sixth sense that new ideas shine in the mind. These ideas take on the nature and form of the dominant theme in the individual's mind. A mastermind can be created by any group of people coordinating their minds in a spirit of perfect harmony. The group can consist of any number, starting from two people, but the best results seem to be obtained with the combination of six or seven minds. It has been discovered that Jesus Christ understood how to use the principle of mental chemistry and his seemingly miraculous performances stemmed from the power he developed through blending the minds of his twelve disciples. It was noted that when one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, broke faith, the mastermind immediately disintegrated and Jesus found himself in the supreme catastrophe of his life. When two or more people harmonize their minds and produce the effect known as the mastermind, each person in the group is invested with the power to contact the subconscious minds of all the other members of the group and accumulate knowledge through them. This power is immediately felt, stimulating the mind to a higher vibratory frequency, manifesting otherwise as a vivid imagination and the awareness of what seems to be a sixth sense. It is through this sixth sense that new ideas shine in the mind. These ideas adopt the nature and form of the dominant theme in the mind of the individual. If the entire group has gathered for the purpose of discussing a specific topic, ideas related to that topic will reach the minds of all present, as if an external influence were dictating them. The minds of the participants in the mastermind become magnets, attracting ideas and thought stimulations of the highest and most organized nature from anywhere. For the process of blending minds described here as a mastermind can be compared to someone connecting many batteries to a single transmission cable, thereby increasing the energy flowing through that line. Each added battery increases the power passing through that line by the amount of energy the battery carries. The same happens in the case of blending individual minds into a mastermind. Each mind, through the principle of mental chemistry, stimulates all the other minds in the group until the mental energy becomes so great that it penetrates and connects with the universal energy known as the ether, which in turn touches every atom in the entire universe. Modern radio devices widely corroborate the theory we are presenting here. Powerful transmitting or broadcasting stations must be erected through which sound vibrations intensify before they can be collected by the much higher vibrational energy of the ether and transported in all directions. A mastermind, formed by many individual thoughts blended to produce strong vibrational energy, constitutes an almost exact counterpart to the broadcasting station. Every public speaker has felt the influence of mental chemistry, as it is well known, that when the individual minds of an audience come into systematic rapport with the vibrational rhythm of the speaker's mind, there is a noticeable increase in enthusiasm in the speaker's mind, often reaching levels of eloquence surprising to everyone, including himself. The first five or ten minutes of an average speech are devoted to what is called warming up, meaning the process by which the minds of the speaker and his audience blend into a spirit of perfect harmony. Every speaker knows what happens when the state of perfect harmony does not materialize in a part of his audience, the seemingly supernatural phenomena that occur at spiritualist meetings are the result of the reaction of the group's minds on each other. These phenomena rarely manifest before 10 or 20 minutes after the group is formed because that is the time required for the minds of the group to harmonize or blend. The messages received by members of a spiritualist group probably come from one of two sources, or both. First, from the vast reservoir of the subconscious image of one of the group members, and second, from the universal reservoir of the ether, in which it is very likely that all thought vibrations are preserved. No known natural law or human reason supports the theory of communication with deceased individuals. It is a known fact that any individual can explore the reservoir of knowledge in another's mind through this principle of mental chemistry. 
and it seems reasonable to assume that this can extend to include contact with any vibration available in the ether, if there is any. The theory that all higher and more refined vibrations, such as those arising from thought, are preserved in the ether stems from the known fact that neither matter nor energy, the two known elements of the universe, can be created or destroyed. It is reasonable to assume that all vibrations that are sufficiently intensified to be collected and absorbed into the ether will continue eternally. Lower vibrations that do not blend into the ether or come into contact with it in some other way will likely have a natural life and fade away. All alleged geniuses have probably earned their reputation because, by chance or otherwise, they have formed alliances with other minds that have allowed them to raise their own mental vibrations to the point of being able to contact the vast temple of knowledge recorded and archived in the ether of the universe. All great geniuses, to the extent that this author has been able to gather facts, were highly sexed individuals. The fact that sexual contact is the greatest known mental stimulant lends credence to the theory described here. Delving further into the source of economic power as manifested in the achievements of businessmen, let's study the case of the Chicago group known as the Big Six, formed by W.M. Wrigley Jr., who owns the gum business bearing his name and whose individual income is said to be over $15 million per year. John R. Thompson, who operates the restaurant chain bearing his name. Mr. Lasker, who owns the Lord & Thomas Advertising Agency. C.W. Macula, who owns Parmalat Express, America's largest moving company, and Mr. Ritchie and Mr. Hertz, who own the Yellow Cab Company. A reliable financial reporting company estimated the annual incomes of these six men at over $25 million, averaging over $4 million per year per man. The analysis of the entire group of six men reveals the fact that none of them had any special educational advantage. All started without significant capital or credit. Their financial successes are due to their individual plans and there is no luck involved. Many years ago, these six men formed a friendly alliance, meeting at determined intervals with the purpose of mutually assisting each other with ideas and suggestions in their various and varied lines of business. With the exception of Hertz and Ritchie, none of. The six men were legally associated. These meetings had the sole purpose of cooperating on the basis of giving and receiving ideas and suggestions occasionally adding notes and other values to help a group member facing an emergency requiring such assistance. It is said that each individual belonging to this group of the Big Six is a millionaire. As a rule, there is nothing worthy of special comment from a man who only accumulates a few million dollars. However, there is something related to the financial success of this particular group of men that is worth commenting on, studying, analyzing, or even emulating and that is the fact that they have learned to coordinate their individual minds by blending them into a spirit of perfect harmony, thus creating a collective intelligence that opens doors to each individual in the group that are closed to most of the human race. The United States Steel Corporation is one of the strongest and most powerful industrial organizations in the world. The idea from which this great industrial giant emerged originated in the mind of Albert H. Gary, a rather ordinary people's lawyer, who was born and raised in a small town in Illinois near Chicago. Mr. Gary surrounded himself with a group of men whose minds were successfully combined in a spirit of perfect harmony, thus creating the collective intelligence that is the driving force behind the mighty United States Steel Corporation. No matter where you look, wherever you find exceptional success in business, finance, industry, or any of the professions, you can be sure that behind this success is an individual who has applied the principle of mental chemistry from which collective intelligence has been created. These outstanding successes often seem to be the work of one person, but if you look carefully, you can find other individuals whose minds are coordinated with yours. Remember that two or more people can use the principle of mental chemistry to create collective intelligence. The power of man lies in organized knowledge expressed through intelligent efforts. No effort can be said to be organized unless the individuals engaged in that effort coordinate their knowledge and energy in a spirit of perfect harmony. 
The lack of this harmonious coordination of efforts is the main cause of practically all business failures. This author conducted an interesting experiment in collaboration with students from a renowned university. Each student was asked to write an essay on how and why Henry Ford became rich. Each student had to describe within the framework of their essay what they thought the nature of Ford's actual assets was, detailing what these assets consisted of. Most students gathered financial statements and inventories of Ford's assets and used them as a basis for estimates of his wealth. Among these sources of Ford's wealth were cash in the bank, raw materials and finished products in stock, real estate and buildings, and goodwill estimated between 10 and 25% of the value of tangible assets. One student from the entire group of several hundred responded as follows. Henry Ford's assets consist mainly of two elements, either working capital and raw materials and finished products, or the knowledge gained through Henry Ford's own experience and the cooperation of a well-trained organization that understands how to apply this knowledge for the greatest benefit. From Ford's perspective, it is impossible to estimate with any approximation the actual dollar and cents value of either of these two groups of assets, but it is my opinion that their relative values are the organized knowledge of the Ford organization at 75% and the value of cash and physical assets of any kind, including raw materials and finished products, at 25%. This author believes that this statement was not compiled by the young person whose name was signed without the help of one or more very analytical and experienced minds. Without a doubt, Henry Ford's greatest asset is his own brain, and alongside him are the brains of his immediate circle of associates, for it is through the coordination of these that the physical assets he controls have been accumulated. Destroy all the factories owned by the Ford Motor Company. Every piece of machinery, every atom of raw material or finished product, every finished car, and every dollar deposited in a bank, and Ford would still be the most economically powerful man on earth. The brains that built Ford's business could duplicate it in a short time. Capital is always available in unlimited quantities for brains like Ford's. He is the most powerful man on earth because he has the keenest and most practical conception of the principle of organized knowledge than any other man on earth, as far as this author has the means to know. Despite Ford's great power and financial success, it is possible that he made mistakes, often in the application of the principles by which he accumulated this power. There is no doubt that Ford's methods of mental coordination must have been necessary at the very beginning of this experience, before he acquired the wisdom of application that would naturally accompany the maturity of the years. There can be little doubt that Ford's application of the principle of mental chemistry was, at least initially, the result of a fortunate alliance with other minds, especially that of Edison. It is more likely that Mr. Ford's remarkable insight into the laws of nature began as a result of his friendly alliances with his own wife long before he knew Mr. Edison or Mr. Firestone. Many men who never know the true source of their success are shaped by their wives. Through the application of the principle of collective intelligence, Mrs. Ford is an extraordinarily intelligent woman. And this, I author has reason to believe that it is her mind blended with Mr. Ford's that gave him his first real impetus toward power. It can be mentioned without depriving Ford of any honor or glory that at the beginning he had to struggle against powerful enemies such as illiteracy and ignorance, even more than Edison or Firestone, both naturally endowed with a lucky attitude to acquire and apply knowledge. Ford had to forge this talent from the raw wood of his hereditary heritage in an incredibly short time. Ford mastered three of humanity's most stubborn enemies and turned them into assets that form the basis of his success. These enemies are ignorance, illiteracy, and poverty. Any man who can break the hand of these three wild forces, and better yet, exploit and use them profitably, deserves to be studied closely by less fortunate individuals. We live in an era of industrial power. The source of all this power is organized effort. Not only has the management of industrial enterprises effectively organized individual workers, but in many cases, industrial mergers have been carried out to accumulate practically unlimited power. One can hardly glance at the news of a day 
without seeing a report of some commercial, industrial or financial merger that brings together under the same direction enormous resources, thus creating great power through highly organized and coordinated effort. General and disorganized knowledge is not power, it is merely potential power, the material from which real power can be developed. Every modern library contains a disorganized record of all the valuable knowledge that the current stage of civilization has inherited. However, this knowledge is not power because it is not organized. Every form of energy and every form of animal or plant life must be organized to survive. Large-sized animals whose bones have filled the courtyard of nature through extinction have left silent but certain proof that non-organization means annihilation. From the electron, the smallest particle of matter, to the largest star in the universe, all these material things offer positive proof that one of the first laws of nature is that of organization. The fortunate individual is the one who recognizes the importance of this law and strives to become familiar with the various ways in which the law can be advantageously applied. The shrewd entrepreneur has not only recognized the importance of the law of organized effort, but has made this law the very fabric of his power. Without any knowledge of the principle of mental chemistry or the existence of such a principle, many men have accumulated great power simply by organizing the knowledge they possessed. Most of those who discovered the principle of mental chemistry and developed it into collective intelligence often encountered this knowledge by the slightest chance, often without recognizing the true nature of their discovery or understanding the source of their power. This author believes that all living persons who truly and consciously use the principle of mental chemistry in the development of power through the blending of minds are very rare. If this estimate is true, even approximately, the student will easily see that there is hardly any danger of saturation in the field of the practice of mental chemistry. It is well known that one of the most difficult tasks a businessman must accomplish is to induce those associated with him to coordinate their efforts in a spirit of harmony. Inducing continuous cooperation among a group of workers in any enterprise is almost impossible. Only the most effective leaders can achieve this desired goal. But occasionally, a leader rises above the horizon in the field of industry, business or finance, and then the world hears about Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, John D. Rockefeller, Sir E. H. Harriman or James J. Hill. Power and success are very similar terms, one grows out of the other. Therefore, everyone has the knowledge and ability to develop power through the principle of harmony. The coordination of efforts among individual minds or in any other way can lead to success in any reasonable undertaking that can be successfully determined. It should not be assumed that a mente maestra will immediately spring up like a mushroom from any group of minds claiming to coordinate in a spirit of harmony. Harmony, in the true sense of the term, is as rare among groups of people as authentic Christianity is among those who proclaim themselves Christians. Harmony is the core around which the mental state known as mente maestra must develop. Without this element of harmony there can be no mente maestra, a truth that cannot be repeated too often. Woodrow Wilson had in mind the development of a mente maestra, composed of groups of minds representing the civilized nations of the world in his proposal to establish the League of Nations. Wilson's conception was the broadest humanitarian idea ever created in the mind of man, for it dealt with a principle powerful enough to establish true human brotherhood on earth. The League of Nations, or a similar mixture of international minds in a spirit of harmony, will certainly become a reality. The time when this unity of minds will occur will be measured largely by the time it takes great universities and non-sectarian educational institutions to replace ignorance and superstition with understanding and wisdom. This time is rapidly approaching. The psychology of revival, a gathering of the old religious known as avivamiento, offers a favorable opportunity to study the principle of mental chemistry known as mente maestra, it will be observed that music plays a significant role in creating the essential harmony for the union of a group of minds during a revival meeting. Without music, the revival meeting would be dull. During avivamiento services, 
the leader of the meeting has no difficulty in creating harmony in the minds of his devotees. But it is well known that this state of harmony lasts only during the leader's presence, after which the mente maestra he created disintegrates temporarily. By awakening the emotional nature of his disciples, the revivalist has no difficulty, under the proper setting and with the right type of music, in creating a mente maestra that becomes perceptible to all those who come into contact with it. The air itself becomes charged with a positive and pleasant influence that changes the chemistry of all minds present. The revivalist calls this energy the Spirit of the Lord. This author, through experiments conducted with a group of scientific and amateur researchers who are unaware of the nature of the experiment, has created the same state of mind and the same positive atmosphere without calling it the Spirit of the Lord. On many occasions, this author has witnessed the creation of the positive atmosphere in a group of men and women dedicated to commerce without calling it the Spirit of the Lord. The author assisted in directing a sales school for Harrison Parker, founder of the Cooperative Society of Chicago, and using the same principle of mental chemistry that the revivalist calls the Spirit of the Lord, significantly transformed the nature of a group of 3,000 men and women, all with no prior sales experience, who sold over $10 million worth of securities in less than nine months and earned over a million for themselves. It was found that the average person joining this school reached his maximum selling power in one week, after which it was necessary to revitalize the individual's brain through a group sales meeting. These sales meetings took place in a very similar order to that of modern religious revival meetings with the same scenic equipment, including music, powerful speakers, exhorting sellers very similarly to what modern religious revival does. Call it religion, psychology, mental chemistry, or whatever you like, it all rests on the same principle. But nothing is more certain than the fact that wherever a group of minds comes into contact in a spirit of perfect harmony, each mind in the group is immediately supplemented and strengthened by a remarkable energy called mente maestra. Because everything written claims to know, this unknown energy may be the spirit of the Lord, but it continues to function favorably when called by any other name. The human brain and nervous system constitute a complex piece of machinery that very few understand. When controlled and directed correctly, this piece of machinery can accomplish wonders, and if left unchecked, it will produce wonders of a fantastic and phantasmagoric nature, as can be seen by examining the inmates of any insane asylum. The human brain has a direct connection to a continuous flow of energy from which man derives his power of thought. The brain receives this energy, mixes it with the energy created by the food ingested into the body, and distributes it to every part of the body through the aid of blood and the nervous system. Thus it becomes what we call life. No one seems to know where this external energy comes from. All we know is that we must have it or die. It seems reasonable to assume that this energy is none other than what we call ether, and that it flows into the body with the oxygen in the air when we breathe. Every normal human body possesses a first-class chemical laboratory and a sufficient supply of chemicals to perform the task of breaking down, assimilating, mixing, and composing the foods ingested into the body before distributing them where they are needed as builders of the body. Many tests have been conducted both with humans and animals, to demonstrate that the energy known as the spirit plays a significant role in this chemical operation of composition and transformation of food into substances necessary to build and maintain the body. It is known that worry, excitement or fear interfere with the digestive process and in extreme cases stop it altogether, causing illness or death. It is evident that the spirit plays a role in the chemistry of digestion and food distribution. Many eminent authorities believe, although it has never been scientifically proven, that the energy known as spirit or thought can be contaminated by negative or antisocial units to the point that the entire nervous system is disabled. Digestion is disrupted and various forms of diseases manifest. Financial difficulties and unreciprocated love affairs top the list of causes for these mental disturbances. A negative environment, such as one where a family member constantly scolds, will interfere with the chemistry of the spirit to such an extent that the individual will lose ambition and gradually sink into oblivion. 
That's why the old saying that a man's wife can make or break him is literally true. In a later lesson, an entire chapter on this subject is devoted to the wives of men. Every high school student knows that certain combinations of foods, if consumed frequently, cause indigestion, violent pain, or even death. Good health depends, at least in part, on a harmonious combination of foods, but the harmony of food combinations alone is not enough to guarantee good health. There must also be harmony among the units of energy known as spirit. Harmony seems to be one of the laws of nature without which there can be no organized energy or life in any form. The health of the body, just like that of the mind, is literally built on the principle of harmony. The energy known as life begins to disintegrate, and death approaches when the organs of the body cease to function harmoniously. The moment harmony ceases at the source of all forms of organized energy, the units of that energy are thrown into a chaotic state of disorder, and power becomes neutral or passive. Harmony is also the core around which the power of the mental chemistry principle, known as mente maestra, develops. If this harmony is destroyed, the power arising from the coordinated effort of a group of individual minds is also destroyed. This truth has been stated, restated, and presented in every conceivable way the author could conceive, with endless repetition, so that the student can grasp this principle and learn to apply it. Success in life, no matter how it is called, is largely a matter of adapting to the environment in such a way that there is harmony between the individual and the surroundings. A king's palace becomes a peasant's hut if harmony does not abound, and conversely a peasant's hut can produce more happiness than a rich man's mansion if harmony prevails in the former. Without perfect harmony, the science of astronomy would be as useless as the bones of a saint because the stars and planets would collide with each other and everything would be in a state of chaos and disorder. Without the law of harmony, a bottle could turn into a heterogeneous tree composed of oak, poplar, maple and other types. Without the law of harmony, blood could deposit the food that grows nails on the scalp, where it is supposed that hair grows, thus creating a horny growth that could be easily mistaken by the superstitious to signify man's relationship with a certain imaginary gentleman with horns, often referenced by the most primitive type. Without the law of harmony, there can be no organization of knowledge, for one might wonder what organized knowledge is if not the harmony of facts, truths, and natural laws. The moment discord begins to enter through the front door, Harmony exits through the back door, so to speak, whether in a commercial society or in the orderly movement of planets in the sky. If the student feels that the author insists too much on the importance of harmony, it must be remembered that the lack of harmony is the first and often the last and only cause of effect. There can be no poetry, music or eloquence worthy of mention without the presence of harmony. Good architecture depends largely on harmony, Without harmony, a house is just a mass of building materials, more or less a monstrosity. The successful management of a business ensures that the nerves of its existence are in harmony. Every well-dressed man or woman is a living image and a moving example of harmony. With all these daily illustrations of the important role that harmony plays in the affairs of the world, it is even more true in the functioning of the entire universe. How an intelligent person could leave harmony out of their defined purpose in life, as well as not having a defined purpose, omitting harmony as the cornerstone of their foundations. The human body is a complex organization of organs, glands, blood vessels, nerves, brain cells, muscles, etc. The energy of the mind that stimulates action and coordinates the efforts of the parts that make up the body is also a plurality of energies that are always variable and changing, from birth to death. There is a continuous struggle that often takes the nature of an open battle between the forces of the mind, for example, the lifelong struggle between the motivating forces and desires of the human mind that takes place between the impulses of good and evil is well known to all. Each human being possesses at least two mental powers or distinct personalities, and up to six distinct personalities have been discovered in one person. One of man's most delicate tasks is to harmonize these mental forces so that they can be organized and directed towards the orderly achievement of a specific goal. 
without this element of harmony, no individual can become a precise thinker. It is not surprising that leaders of commercial and industrial enterprises, as well as those in politics and other fields of activity, find it so difficult to organize groups of people to function in the achievement of a specific goal without friction. Each individual has forces within himself that are difficult to harmonize, even when placed in the most favorable environment for harmony. If the chemistry of an individual's mind is such that the units of his mind cannot easily harmonize, it is difficult to imagine how difficult it must be to harmonize a group of minds to function as one in an orderly manner through what is called a mente maestra, master mind. The leader who successfully develops and directs the energies of a master mind must possess tact, patience, persistence, self-confidence, and intimate knowledge of the chemistry of the mind, and the ability to adapt in a state of perfect assurance and harmony to rapidly changing circumstances, without showing the slightest sign of embarrassment. How many can measure up to this requirement? The successful leader must have the ability to change the color of his mind like a chameleon, to adapt to each circumstance that arises in relation to the object of his leadership. Moreover, he must have the ability to switch from one state of mind to another without showing the slightest sign of anger or loss of self-control. The successful leader must understand the 15 laws of success and be able to put into practice any combination of these 15 laws whenever the occasion demands it. Without this ability, no leader can be powerful, and without power, no leader can last long. The meaning of education has long been misunderstood. Dictionaries have not contributed to eliminating this misunderstanding because they have defined the word educate as an act of imparting knowledge. The word educate has its roots in the Latin word educo, which means to develop from within, to raise. By the law of usage, nature abhors idleness in all its forms. It gives life only to elements that are in use. Tie up an arm or any other part of the body, leaving that part unused, and it will soon become paralyzed and lifeless. Reverse the order. Give an arm more use than usual as the blacksmith who wields a heavy hammer all day does, and that arm, developed from within, will strengthen. Power emerges from organized knowledge, but beware, it emerges through application and usage. A man can become a walking encyclopedia of knowledge without possessing any real power. This knowledge only transforms into power to the extent that it is organized, classified, and put into action. Some of the most well-educated men the world has known had much less general knowledge than some considered ignorant. The difference between the two is that the former put into use the knowledge they possessed, while the latter did not make such an application. An educated person is one who knows how to acquire everything he needs to achieve his main goal in life without violating the rights of others. He could be a person for many so-called scholars, knowing that they do not come close to the classification of educated men could also be a great surprise for many who think they suffer from a lack of learning. Knowing that they are well educated, the successful lawyer is not necessarily the one who memorizes the most legal principles. On the contrary, the successful lawyer is the one who knows where to find a legal principle, in addition to a variety of opinions that support that principle and meet the immediate needs of a particular case. In other words, the successful lawyer is the one who knows where to find the law he wants when he needs it. This principle applies with equal force to industrial and commercial affairs. Henry Ford had only a limited elementary education, and yet he is one of the most educated men in the world because he acquired the unique ability to combine natural and economic laws, not to mention the minds of men in a unique way, giving him the power to obtain anything he wants from material nature. A few years ago, during World War I, Mr. Ford brought a lawsuit against the Chicago Tribune, accusing it of defamation. One of the statements said that Ford was ignorant, an ignorant pacifist, etc. When the case came before the court, the Tribune's lawyers undertook to prove by Ford's own testimony that their statement was true, that he was ignorant, and for that purpose they catechized and questioned him on all kinds of subjects. One of the questions he was asked was, how many soldiers did the British send to quell the rebellion in the colonies in 1776? With a smile on his face, Ford replied indifferently, 
I don't know how many, but I heard there were a lot more than those who came back. Loud laughter resounded from the jury, spectators in the courtroom, and even the frustrated lawyer who had asked the question. This line of questioning continued for an hour or more, with Ford remaining calm throughout. Eventually, however, he allowed the clever lawyers to play with him until he had had enough. In response to a particularly odious and insulting question, Ford straightened up, pointed at the questioning lawyer and replied, If you really want an answer to the stupid question you just asked, or any of the other ones you've asked, let me remind you that I have a row of electric buttons hanging at my desk. And by pressing the appropriate button, I could summon men who would give me the correct answer to all the questions you've asked, and many others you don't have the intelligence to ask or answer. Now will you please tell me why I should bother filling my mind with a multitude of useless details to answer any stupid question you might ask, when I have capable men around me who can provide me with all the data I want when I ask them? This response is quoted from memory, but it substantially relates to Ford's actual response. There was silence in the room. The questioning lawyer dropped his jaw and opened his eyes wide. The judge leaned forward from the bench and looked in Mr. Ford's direction. Many members of the jury woke up and looked around as if they had heard an explosion, which, in fact, had occurred. An eminent clergyman present in the courtroom at that moment later said that the scene reminded him of what should have happened when Jesus Christ was judged before Pontius Pilate, just after he had given his famous answer to Pilate's question. What is truth? In the vernacular of the time, Ford's response left his interlocutor speechless. Up to that point, the lawyer had been having a good time at the expense of what he believed to be Ford, skillfully exhibiting his case as a sample of general knowledge and comparing it to what he inferred from Ford's ignorance of many events and subjects. But this response spoiled the lawyer's fun and once again demonstrated to all those who had the intelligence to accept the evidence that true education means the development of the mind, not just the collection and classification of knowledge. Most likely, Ford could not have named the capitals of all the states of the United States, but he could bring together, and indeed he did, the capital with which he turns many wheels within each state of the nation. Education, let's not forget, consists of the power to obtain anything one needs when one needs it without violating the rights of others. Portia adjusts this definition, and for the reason that the author attempted to explain here by recounting a previous incident related to a simple philosophy of Ford. There are many knowledgeable men who could easily confuse Ford theoretically with a labyrinth of questions he himself could not personally answer. But Ford could turn the situation around and trigger a battle in industry or finance that would eliminate these same men with all their knowledge and wisdom. Ford could enter his chemical laboratory and separate water into its constituent atoms of hydrogen and oxygen then recombine these atoms in their original order. But he knows how to surround himself with chemists who can do it for him if he wishes. The man who can intelligently use the knowledge he possesses is a man as educated, if not more so, than the one who simply has knowledge but does not know well what to do with it. The president of a renowned university inherited a large tract of very poor land. This land had no commercially valuable wood, minerals, or other valuable elements so it was just an expense for him, as he had to pay taxes on it. The state built a road through the land. An uneducated man driving his car on this road noticed that this poor land was on top of a mountain overlooking a magnificent view for many kilometres in all directions. This man also observed that the land was covered with a growth of small pines and other shrubs. He bought fifty. Acres of land for ten tuttles an acre near the public road, built a unique log house to which he added a large dining hall. Near the house, he set up a gas station, built a dozen one-room wooden houses along the road that he rented to tourists at three dollars a night each. The dining hall, gas station and wooden houses netted him an income of fifteen thousand dollars the first year. The next year, he expanded his plan by adding fifty more wooden houses, each with three bedrooms which he now rents as summer cottages to people from a nearby city for $150 each for the season. The building material cost him nothing as it grew abundantly on his land, the same land that the university president thought was worthless. 
Additionally, the unique and unusual appearance of the log cabins served as advertising for the plan. While many would have considered it a real calamity if they had to build with such rustic materials within five miles of the location of these log cabins, this same man bought an old worked farm of 150 acres for $25 an acre, a price the seller thought extremely high. By building a 100-foot-long dam, the buyer of this old farm turned a stream into a lake covering 15 acres of land. He filled the lake with fish, then sold the farm in building lots to people who wanted summer places around the lake. The total profit from this simple transaction was over $25,000, and the time required to complete the transaction was one summer. However, this visionary and imaginative man was not educated in the most orthodox sense of the term. Note the fact that it is through these simple illustrations of the use of organized knowledge that one can become educated and powerful. Speaking of the transaction described here, the university president who sold the 50 acres of worthless land for $500 said, Think about it. This man whom most of us might call ignorant mixed his ignorance with 50 acres of worthless land and made sure the combination brings in more annually than what I earn with five years of applying the so-called education. There is not one chance, but dozens of them in every state of America, to put into practice the idea described here. Now, study the layout of all the lands you see that are similar to those described in this lesson, and you might find a suitable place to develop a similar business and make money. The idea is particularly adaptable in locations where bathing beaches are scarce, as people naturally love these amenities. The automobile has led to the construction of an extensive network of public highways across the United States. Virtually on each of these highways, there is a suitable place for a vacation town for tourists, which can become a regular goldmine for the man with the imagination and confidence to do it. There are opportunities to make money around you. This course was designed to help you see these opportunities and inform you on how to make the most of them after discovering them. Who can benefit most from the philosophy of the law of success? Railroad officials who want a better spirit of cooperation between their train conductors and the public they serve. Employees who want to increase their earning power and market their services with more advantages. Salespeople who want to become masters in their chosen field. The philosophy of the law of success covers all known laws of sales, including many features not included in any other course. Factory managers who understand the value of greater harmony among their employees, railroad employees who want to establish records of efficiency, leading to positions of greater responsibility with higher pay, traders who want to expand their business by adding new customers. The philosophy of the law of success will help any trader increase his business by teaching him to make mobile advertising of every customer who enters his shop, automobile agents who want to increase selling power. Much of the Law of Success course has been developed from the work of a lifetime and the experience of the greatest living automobile salesman and is therefore exceptionally helpful for the sales manager who leads the efforts of automobile salesmen. Life insurance agents who want to add new policy holders and increase the insurance of current policy holders. A life insurance salesman in Ohio sold a $150,000 policy to one of the executives of the Central Steel Company following a single reading of the lesson on how to leverage failures. This same salesman became one of the most prominent men in the life. Insurance company's staff in New York due to his training in the 15 laws of success. School teachers who want to climb the ranks in their current profession or are looking for an opportunity to enter the most profitable field of business as a lifelong job. The Law of Success course covers a complete personal analysis service that helps the philosophy student determine the work for which he is best suited. Bankers who want to expand their business through better methods and more courteous service to their clients, bank employees who have the ambition to prepare for leadership positions in banking or in a commercial or industrial field, doctors and dentists who want to expand their practice without violating the ethics of their profession through direct advertising. A prominent doctor stated that the Law of Success course was worth a thousand dollars for any professional man or woman whose professional ethics prevents direct advertising. Promoters 
who want to develop new and hitherto unexplored combinations in business or industry, the principle described in this introductory lesson is said to have made a small fortune for a man who used it as the basis for a real estate promotion, real estate agents who want new methods to promote sales. This introductory lesson contains a description of an entirely new real estate promotion plan that is sure to make fortunes for many of those who implement it. This plan can be used in all states and can also be employed by men who have never promoted a business, farmers who want to discover new methods of marketing their products for a higher net return, and those who own land suitable for the promotion of subdivisions. According to the plan mentioned at the end of this introductory lesson, thousands of farmers have gold mines on the lands they own that are not suitable for cultivation, which could be used for recreational and tourist purposes on a very profitable basis. Screenwriters and editors, looking for a practical plan to promote themselves to higher and better paid positions, say that the Law of Success course is the best course ever written on the subject of marketing personal services. Printers who want a larger volume of business and more efficient production resulting from better cooperation among their own employees. Day labourers who have the ambition to rise to positions of greater responsibility in jobs that have more responsibilities and therefore offer higher pay. Lawyers who want to expand their clientele through dignified and ethical methods that make them favourably accessible to a larger number of people in need of legal services. Entrepreneurs who want to expand their current business or manage their current volume with fewer expenses resulting from greater cooperation among their employees, laundry owners, who want to expand their business by teaching their drivers to provide more courteous and efficient service. General life insurance agents who want larger and more efficient sales organizations. Store chain managers who want a larger volume of business resulting from more effective individual sales efforts. Married individuals who are unhappy and as a result are not successful due to a lack of harmony and cooperation at home for all that is described in the above classification, the philosophy of the law of success offers definite and quick help. Summary of the introduction. The purpose of this summary is to help the student master the central idea around which the introduction has developed. This idea, represented by the term mastermind, has been detailed throughout the introduction. All new ideas, especially those of an abstract nature, settle in the human mind only after many repetitions. A well-known truth that explains the reaffirmation in this summary of the principle known as the mastermind. A mastermind can be developed by a friendly alliance in a spirit of harmony of purposes between two or more minds. This is an appropriate place to explain that every alliance of minds, whether in a spirit of harmony or not, develops another mind that affects all participants in the alliance. Never have two or more minds met without creating from the contact otherwise, but not always. This invisible creation is a mastermind. From the meeting of two or more minds can arise, and too often it does, a negative power that is the opposite of a mastermind. There are certain minds that, as has already been said throughout this lesson, cannot blend in a spirit of harmony. This principle has its comparable analogue in chemistry, whose reference allows the student to understand more clearly the principle being referred to. For example, the chemical formula H2O, which means the combination of two hydrogen atoms with one oxygen atom, transforms these two elements into water. One hydrogen atom and one oxygen atom do not produce water, and they cannot be made to associate in harmony. There are many known elements that, when combined, immediately change from harmless substances into deadly poisons. In other words, many well-known toxic elements neutralize and become harmless when combined with other specific elements, just as the combination of certain elements changes their entire nature. The combination of certain minds changes the nature of those minds, producing a certain degree of what has been called a mastermind or its opposite, which is highly destructive. Any man who has found his mother-in-law incompatible has experienced the negative application of the principle known as the mastermind. For a reason still unknown to researchers in the field of mental behavior, most mothers-in-law seem to affect their daughters' husbands very negatively. The meeting of their minds with those of their sons-in-law creates a highly antagonistic influence rather than a mastermind. 
This fact is too well known to require further comment. Some minds will not harmonize and cannot blend in a mastermind, a fact that all leaders of men would do well to remember. It is the leader's responsibility too. Group his men in such a way that those placed in the most strategic points of his organization are composed of individuals whose minds can and want to be blended in a spirit of friendship and harmony. The ability to group elements is the main quality emphasized in the leadership of the second lesson of this course. The student will discover that this ability was the main source of power and wealth accumulated by the late Andrew Carnegie, without having any technical knowledge of the steel industry. Carnegie combined and grouped in a way that built the most successful steel industry known in the world. During his lifetime, Henry Ford's gigantic success can be attributed to the successful application of the same principle. Ford, however, did not rely on himself to acquire the knowledge necessary for the successful development of his industries. Like Carnegie, he surrounded himself with men who provided him with the knowledge he did not possess. Additionally, Ford chose men capable of harmonizing and doing so in the group effort. The most effective alliances that led to the creation of the principle known as mastermind were developed from the blending of the minds of men and women. This is because the minds of men and women blend more easily in harmony than the minds of men alone. Moreover, the additional stimulus of sexual contact often enters into the development of a mastermind between a man and a woman. It is well known that the male of the species is more lively and alert in the pursuit of any goal when inspired by a woman. This human trait begins to manifest itself in men during adolescence and continues throughout their lives. Elbert too understood this principle and acted accordingly when he realized that incompatibility with his first wife was leading him to certain defeat. The main goal of a man in life is to succeed. The path to success can be hindered by many influences, and one of the most harmful is the unfortunate alliance with minds that do not harmonize. In such cases, the alliance must be broken or defeat and failure will be inevitable. The man who has overcome the six fundamental fears, including the fear of criticism, will have no hesitation in taking drastic measures when he feels hindered by antagonistic alliances. It is better to face criticism than to be led to failure by disharmonious alliances, whether in a professional or social context. The author justifies divorce here when the conditions surrounding marriage make harmony impossible. This does not mean that the lack of harmony cannot be eliminated by means other than divorce as there are cases where antagonism can be eliminated and harmony restored without resorting to divorce. The course emphasizes the principle of mastermind and highlights its close connection to the law of the functioning of the mind. It is essential for the student to fully understand this law before proceeding with the other choices of the course, as practically the entire course is closely related to this law. If the student is unsure of having understood this law, they are encouraged to contact the course author for more detailed explanations by asking questions about points requiring further information. You cannot devote too much time to seriously reflecting and contemplating the law of the mastermind. For once you have mastered this law and learned to apply it, new worlds of opportunities will open up to you. This introductory lesson, although not designed as an independent lesson from the Law of Success course, contains enough information for the sales-oriented student to become a master of sales. Any sales organization can make effective use of the law of the mastermind by grouping sellers into new groups of two or more people, aligning themselves in a spirit of friendly cooperation and applying this law as suggested in this lesson. A well-known car brands agent employing 12 sellers grouped his team into six groups of two men each to apply the law of the mastermind, resulting in all sellers setting new sales records. The same organization created the weekly club, meaning that each man belonging to the club has, on average, sold one car per week since the club's creation. The results of this effort were astonishing for all. Each man belonging to the club received a list of 100 potential car buyers. Each seller sends a postcard per week to each of his potential buyers and personally calls at least 10 of them each day. Each postcard describes a single advantageous feature of the car the seller is selling and requests a personal meeting. 
Interviews quickly increased, as did sales. The agent employing these sellers offered an additional cash bonus to each seller who deserves to be a member of the weekly club by averaging one car per week. The plan injected new vitality into the entire organization, and the results of the plan are reflected in the weekly sales records of each seller. A similar plan could be effectively adopted by a life insurance agency. Any enterprising general agent could easily double or even triple the volume of his business with the same number of sellers using this plan. Virtually no changes would be necessary in the method of using the plan. The club could be called the weekly policy club, meaning that each member commits to selling at least one policy of an agreed minimum amount each week. The student of this course who has mastered the second lesson and understands how to apply the foundations of this main lesson will be able to use the plan described here more effectively. It is neither suggested nor intended that any student undertake to apply the principles of this lesson, which is merely an introductory lesson, before mastering at least the next five lessons of the Law of Success course. The main purpose of this introductory lesson is to present some of the principles on which the course is based. These principles are described more specifically, and the student learns very precisely how to apply them in the individual lessons of the course. The car sales organization mentioned in this summary meets once a week, devoting an hour and a half to the meal and discussion of ways and means of applying the principles of this course. This gives each man the opportunity to benefit from the ideas of all other members of the organization. Two tables are arranged for lunch. At one table, all those who have earned the right to be members of the weekly club are seated. At the other table, served with tinware instead of porcelain, are seated all those who have not earned the right to be members of the club. Needless to say, the latter are subject to considerable reprimands from the luckier members sitting at the other table. It is possible to make almost infinite adaptations of this plan, both in the field of car sales and in other fields. The justification for its use is that it pays off. Not only does the leader or manager of the organization pay, but also every member of the sales force. This plan has been briefly described for the purpose of showing the student of this course how to make a practical application of the principles outlined in this course. The final test of any theory, rule or principle is that it actually works. The law of the mastermind has proved sound because it works. If you understand this law, you are ready to move on to lesson two, where you will delve deeper into the application of the principles described in this introductory lesson your six most dangerous enemies will be presented to you after class with the author. The six spectres to master are the fear of poverty, the fear of death, the fear of ill health, the fear of the loss of love, the fear of old age, the fear of criticism. All people on earth are afraid of something. Most fears are inherited. In this essay you will study the six fundamental fears that cause the most harm, your fears must be mastered before you can succeed in any worthwhile endeavor in life. Find out how many of these six fears bother you, but more importantly, also determine how to conquer these fears. In this chart, you have the opportunity to study our six worst enemies. These enemies are not beautiful. The artist who drew this chart did not depict them as ugly as they really are. If he had, no one would have believed it. While you hear about these contemptible characters, Analyze yourself and find out which of them harms you the most. The purpose of this essay is to help the listeners of this course get rid of these deadly enemies. Note that the six characters are behind you where you cannot easily see them. Every human being on this earth is bound to some extent by one or more of these invisible fears. The first step to get rid of these enemies is to discover where and how you acquired them. They seized you through two forms of inheritance. One is known as physical inheritance, which Darwin devoted many studies to. The other is known as social inheritance, through which the fears, superstitions, and beliefs of men who lived during the Dark Ages have been transmitted from generation to generation. Let's first examine the role that inheritance played in creating these six fundamental fears. Starting from the beginning, we realize that nature has been a cruel creator, from the lowest form of life to the highest. Nature has allowed the strongest to prey on the weakest forms of animal life. Fish feed on worms and insects, 
birds feed on fish, higher forms of animal life feed on birds and so on until man. Human beings feed on all other lower forms of animal life and on man as well. The entire history of evolution is an uninterrupted chain of evidence of cruelty and destruction of the weaker by the stronger. It is not surprising that the weaker forms of animal life have learned to fear the stronger. World consciousness is born in every living animal. So far, the instinct of fear has come to us through physical inheritance. Now let's examine social inheritance and discover the role it has played in our constitution. The term social inheritance refers to everything we are taught, everything we learn or gather through observation and experience with other living beings. Set aside the prejudices and fixed opinions you have formed, at least temporarily, and you will be able to know the truth about your six worst enemies. Starting with the fear of poverty, it takes courage to tell the truth about the history of this enemy of humanity, and even more courage to listen to the truth after it has been told. The fear of poverty arises from man's habit of gaining economic advantage over his fellows, animals that have the instinct but not the power to think, devour each other physically. Man, with his higher sense of intuition and his most powerful weapon thought, does not eat his fellow beings physically. He derives more pleasure by devouring them financially. Such is man in this sense that almost all states and nations have been compelled to enact laws, dozens of laws, to protect the weak from the strong. Every law is indisputable evidence of man's nature to profit from his economically weaker brother. The second of the six fundamental fears to which man is bound is the fear of old age. This fear arises from two main causes. First, the thought that old age may bring poverty. Second, false and cruel sectarian teachings that have been so mixed with fire and brimstone that every human has learned to fear old age because it meant the approach of another world, perhaps more horrible than this one. The third of the six fundamental fears is the fear of ill health, this fear arises from both physical and social inheritance. From birth to death, there is an eternal war inside every physical body. It is a war between groups of cells in a body, one group known as friendly builders of the body and the other as destroyers or disease germs. The seed of fear is born in the physical body from the start due to nature's cruel plan that allows the strongest cellular life forms to benefit from the weaker ones. Social inheritance has played its role through lack of cleanliness and knowledge of holiness, as well as through the law of suggestion skillfully manipulated by those who profit from sick health. The fourth of the six fundamental fears is the fear of losing someone's love. This fear fills asylums with jealous lunatics, as jealousy is nothing but a form of madness that fills divorce courts and murder cases, as well as other forms of cruel punishments. It is a vestige transmitted by social inheritance from the Stone Age when predatory man appropriated his fellow by physically stealing his partner. The method, but not the practice, has changed to some extent. Instead of physical force, man now steals his partner with pretty coloured ribbons, luxurious cars, alcoholic beverages, precious stones and lordly mansions. Man now improves, attracts where he once drove. The fifth of the six fundamental fears is the fear of criticism. It is difficult to determine how and where man acquired this fear, but he did. Without this fear, men would not become bald. Bald heads come from hats that are too tight, cutting off circulation from the hair roots. Women are rarely bald because they wear loose hats, but because of the fear of criticism, man would abandon his hat and retain his hair. Clothing manufacturers have not been slow to capitalize on this fundamental fear of humanity. Every season, styles change because clothing manufacturers know that few people have the courage to wear a garment that is out of fashion. If you doubt it, look at men walking down the street with last year's narrow-brimmed hat when this year's style calls for a wide brim, or observe ladies walking down the street on Easter morning with last year's hat. See how uncomfortable they are thanks to your invisible enemy, the fear of criticism. The sixth and last of the six fundamental fears is the most dreaded of all. It is called the fear of death. For tens of thousands of years, man has been asking unanswered questions. The cleverest of the race did not hesitate to offer the answer to this eternal question. 
Enter my shop, says a leader, and you will be able to go to heaven after death. Heaven was then imagined as a wonderful city, whose streets were paved with gold and studded with precious stones. Stay outside my shop and you will go straight to hell. Hell was then imagined as a burning oven, where the poor victim might have the misery of burning eternally in sulphur. It is no wonder that humanity fears death. Go back to the image at the beginning of this essay and determine if you can identify which of the six fundamental fears harms you the most. A discovered enemy is a half-defeated enemy. Thanks to schools and colleges, man gradually discovers these six enemies. The most effective tool to fight them is organized knowledge. Ignorance and fear are twin sisters, usually found together. If it were not for ignorance and superstition, the six fundamental fears would disappear from human nature in a generation. In every public library, the remedy for these six enemies of humanity can be found, provided you know which book to read. Start reading The Conquest of Fear by Benjamin Kitt, and you will have eliminated the dominance of most of your six fundamental fears. Then read Emerson's essay on compensation and choose a good book on auto-suggestion to learn about the principle that your beliefs today become the realities of tomorrow. Robinson's book Mind in the Making will give you a good start to understand your own thinking. The ignorance and superstition of the Dark Ages have been transmitted to you through the principle of social inheritance, but you live in a modern age. Everywhere you can see evidence that every effect has a natural cause. Start now to study effects by their causes, and you will soon free your mind from the burden of the six fundamental fears. Start studying men who have accumulated great wealth and discover the cause of their successes. Henry Ford is a good subject to begin with. In the span of 25 years, he eradicated poverty and became the most powerful man on earth. There was no luck, no chance, no accident behind his success. It was the result of his careful observation of certain principles that are as accessible to you as they were to him. Henry Ford is not limited by the six fundamental fears. If you think you are too distant from Ford to study him closely, start by choosing two people you know well, one representing your idea of failure and the other corresponding to your idea of success. Find out what made one a failure and the other a success. By collecting these facts, you will have learned a great lesson about cause and effect. Nothing happens by chance from the lowest crawling animal on land or swimming in the seas to man. It is the effect of the evolutionary process of nature. Evolution is an ordered change. No miracle is associated with this ordered change. Not only do the physical forms and colors of animals undergo a slow and ordered change from generation to generation, but the mind of man also is in constant evolution. That is where your hope for improvement lies. You have the power to force your mind through a process of rather rapid change. In just one month of correctly directed auto-suggestion, you can put your foot on the neck of each of the six fundamental fears. In 12 months of persistent effort, you can drive the entire herd into a corner where it will no longer cause you serious harm. You will look tomorrow like the dominant thoughts you keep alive in your mind today. Plant in your mind the seed of determination to tame your six fundamental fears, and the battle will be half won at that point. Keep that intention in your mind, and slowly you will push your six worst enemies out of sight because they exist nowhere but in your own head. The powerful man fears nothing, not even God. The powerful man loves God, but never fears him. Lasting power never arises from fear. Any power built on fear is destined to collapse and disintegrate. Understand this great truth, and you will never be miserable enough to try to rise to power through the fears of others who may be bound by temporary loyalty. Man is made of soul and body for acts of high resolution. In the soul, the boldest fantasies for flying without fatigue, without fear, for transforming the sharpest pains into tranquility and savoring the joys that give meaning and mingle the spirit. Or he is formed for rejection and misery, to crawl in the mire of his fears, to shrink at every sound, to extinguish the flame of natural love in sensuality, to know the blessed hour when on his useless days the icy hand of death will set its seal, but he fears healing, though he detests illness. One is the man he will be in the future, the other the man that vice has made of him now. 
Thank you very much for your visit.